Is it still a controversial opinion to not care for Sarah J Maas? I am not sure. What's up you guys? So I mentioned in my last video that I am currently living back in my house. The one good thing about being here is that I am back where all of my books are. And so I decided to do a little video experiment since I do have all my books here with me. Obviously when you grow up your taste in media changes and I've noticed that my reading taste has changed a lot over the years. And so since I have all my old books here with me, I decided to go back and read some of my old favorites to see if I still like them. So what I did was I logged into my Goodreads account, scrolled through all the books that I've given five star ratings over the years. There are a lot of books on there that have five Five star ratings that may not necessarily deserve them anymore because I am older and wiser and an adult and now have different tastes and what I like. So I chose five of the books from that list of my five star ratings. I decided to go only with either the first book in a series or books that are standalones so that I wasn't jumping right into a plot where I may have forgotten the characters or the world building or anything like that. Obviously it's going to take me a while to read through five books again so I'll just be checking in kind of vlog style every once in a while to update you on my thoughts opinions and then at the end of each book I will be giving you my old rating which is five stars versus my new rating whatever that may be and my reasons for changing it if it has changed. I'll be reading these books backwards in chronological order so I'll be starting with the one that came out most recently and going back to the oldest one. So the very first book that I'll be reading is the one that I have been calling my favorite standalone and that is The Darkest Part of the Forest by Holly Black. Now Darkest Part of the Forest came before Cruel Prince. It was not her first fairy series it was one of the middle ones but it actually takes place in the same universe as Cruel Prince and has some of the same characters. From there I'll be going on to two books that I read in February of 2015, the first of which being Snow Like Ashes by Sarah Rush, and the second, the ever infamous Throne of Glass by Sarah J Maas. Curious to see what I think of this now. From there I'll be going on to a book that I read in February of 2014 and that is Legend by Marie Lu. Now if you guys watched my channel you saw that I did a review of the book Rebel which is the fourth book in this series. I gave Rebel five stars. I'm curious to see if I go back and read Legend and if I also think the Legend is five stars. And last but not least I have the oldest book on this list. This book I read in January of 2012. That seems like a million years ago ancient history. But that book is Looking for Alaska by John Green. Now this was actually my favorite book of all time until Darkest Part of the Forest came along. So again, very interested to see if my opinions have changed on this. So I'll be going backwards reading, starting with Darkest Part of the Forest and ending with Looking for Alaska, throwing in my opinions about each book as I read them. Hope you stick along for the ride and see what I think. And then at the end, I'll do a little wrap up summary of how each of my ratings has changed over the years and maybe how or why my taste in books has changed. So let's get started. Okay, so you know how you just like project on fictional characters whenever you're like reading or watching movies or whatever? Yeah, I know why I consider this book to be my favorite for years and it's literally just me projecting all of my fantasies onto these characters characters. You know sometimes you just daydream about like making out with a fairy prince and then him falling in love with you and kidnapping you off to fairy world. Like that sounds like a great deal. Like I don't have to work anymore. I don't have to go to school. I have to have a job. I could just like sit here and drink fairy wine and like chill. Just sign me up. I think I was so drawn to the characters in this book because they are just normal people and it's just like a sprinkling of weird creepy fairy stuff happening in the background. So just finished this. Um, I started this morning and finished it now so that's uh, like 300 pages in one day. All right, it is three hours later and now that my central nervous system has calmed down a little bit, I can actually form coherent thoughts about this. So, Darkest Part of the Forest. First time I read it was rated five stars. Second time I read it, I'm gonna keep that five star rating. I enjoyed it just as much as I did the first time I read it, if not more. I had that weird fluttery giddy feeling in my heart when I finished reading this and it's not even that this is like okay yes this book involves romance obviously it's not like a super lovey gushy like word vomit fest of romance like in the same way that the Cruel Prince trilogy is not just romance like there is an actual action plot happening. I'm gonna draw a lot of comparisons between this and the Cruel Prince obviously same author same sub -drama, a lot of the same tropes these books are not the most innovative like awe-inspiring original stories you will ever read and even Holly Black goes as far as to use the same exact trope in both of these series which I had kind of forgotten about until just now. Very very mild spoilers for both series. In Darkest Part of the Forest there are siblings Hazel and Ben Evans who are both in love with the fairy prince Severin and then in the Cruel Prince trilogy you have Jude and Taryn twin sisters who both have feelings for the fairy Locke so it, it's literally the same exact plot line but obviously they play out a little differently. One thing I kind of surprised myself with was that even though I have been calling this book my favorite for years I actually forgot about a 
good amount of the plot. The general synopsis is that Hazel and Ben Evans live in the town of Fairfold and there is a fairy prince asleep in a coffin in the woods and one day they wake up and the coffin is shattered and the fairy prince is gone and no one knows how he got out or why he chose now to escape. The entire plot is figuring what, who, or how got him out, what he's doing, where he is, and how this is going to change how the Fae in Fairfold are treating the citizens now that their prince is missing. And even though I knew how it ends, obviously, I feel like it didn't take away any of my enjoyment from learning the plot again. It's been long enough where I kind of forgot how it goes in the middle. I know the beginning, I know the end, but I can't remember how we got there. Reliving that experience over again was just so rewarding for me because it reminded me how much I love the kind of stories where there's so many details interweaved. And with this being a standalone, it's such a satisfying thing because you'll read it in one sitting or like in one week or two and all of the threads kind of come together. And I feel like that's so well done in a standalone versus when it's done in a series where you may have learned a plot point two or three books ago that you don't even really remember reading and then it comes up later and you're like, who said that and who was involved and what? And in that way, I believe that Darkest Part of the Forest is a stronger series than the Cruel Prince trilogy for me personally just because all the plot threads are introduced and then wrapped up. Whereas reading The Cruel Prince, at least I personally thought and a lot of other readers and reviewers that I heard about also thought there were certain plot points and little details trickled in in the first and second books that didn't pay off in the third book or at least didn't pay off as well as they were kind of hyped up to. In a standalone there's no room for okay let's wait and see how this plays off in book two or three or four. Like you have to start and end the series all right there. Other thoughts? Uh, I'm a big old sappy hopeless romantic and the love story and this is really really cute. So like if you're missing out on Cruel Prince, if you missed the series and you want to read about more fairy boys falling in love with mortals, like this is the book for you. Go for it. I 100% recommend it. Again, I'm keeping it at my five star rating. One out of five. Done. It is 3 in the morning. I'm gonna go to sleep. I'll start on Throne of Glass tomorrow because right now I do not have the mental patience to dive into that just yet. All right, day number two of reading, book number two of this challenge. Honestly, this book is the whole reason I'm doing this video. I was thinking back to my maximum ride phase when I was like super into those books and now I realize that they're like not good. So I wanted to go back and think like what other like super hyped up books from my teenage years may not be so good. And the first thing that came to my mind was Throne of Glass. Again, sorry if you're offended, but I have a really good feeling that I'm not gonna like this as much as I did when I first read it. So let's see if I'm being judgmental or if that's actually a valid criticism that I have for my 16 year old self. You know, I think Sarah J Moss's Faye kind of lie in a weird in-between that's like not quite Tinkerbell, but not quite like the murderous tricksters. Like they're, they're attractive and sparkly and like can do magical stuff, but they're not like super devious. Like, yeah, they're kind of like assholes, I guess, but more so than Tinkerbell and less so than like actual Faye that you should be threatened by. Does that make sense? It's like everybody is so pretty in this universe, like no one's allowed to be ugly. If you haven't read this book in a while or if you've never read it, I want someone to go back and count how many times Sarah J Maas uses the word pretty or handsome to describe somebody because I swear I've read the word pretty like 80 times and I'm only on page 80. Like she thinks the world is this horrible, cruel, ugly place full of terrible people but all the terrible people are really hot so like it's fine. Alright, quick little preface warning, I'm going to talk about some body image things so if it's going to bother you or it's going to be a little hard for you to listen to, go ahead and skip to the next clip. So been a couple days. I haven't been reading as much as I want to, but I'm about halfway through now and reading this book, I'm remembering what the original hype was about. So a lot of parallels were drawn between Throne of Glass and Hunger Games. Mild spoilers for the book if you haven't read it, but it's nothing too major. There's basically a competition where all the assassins in this country, kingdom, land, whatever, are competing to be the king's private main personal assassin. There were parallels drawn to this series and the Hunger Games in that you kind of thought that Selena and the other assassins would be competing against each other in a Hunger Games-esque way. Yeah, there is that competition aspect, but the other assassins in Throne of Glass aren't dying due to any like killing competition. They're dying from what is currently halfway through this book an unknown cause or their own mistakes during the trials. And this brings me to an interesting parallel between this book and The Hunger Games in that Katniss Everdeen grew up in District 12. She was poor, she was starving. Whereas in this book, Selena starts off in a prison and then is released to go compete in this competition. And so she is also skinny and weak and frail, not necessarily because she's starving or doesn't have food, but because she was in intentionally not well fed in prison and also was worked very hard and she has scars all over her body things like that. Sarah J Maas has had Selena vomit 
or mention vomiting like seven different times so far in this book. And at the same time, both Kale and Dorian, the two male love interests, the captain, the guard, and the prince, both make comments about her body being curvy or being like nice to look at. And I just, for Katniss Everdeen, yeah, it makes sense. She is starving, she is poor. No one ever makes comments about her looking good because she's that frail. They're worried because she's starving. Whereas Selena, even though she can't run a mile without vomiting all over herself. Dorian still stares at her and thinks her curves are pretty and like thinks about being with her. Like it's just, just like the over sexualization of the female characters when they're in situations that shouldn't be sexy. Selena is scary. She's an assassin. She's a murderer. She's cruel and manipulative. And yet we're also supposed to see her as appealing. And just to make myself 100% clear, there is no reason that Selena can't be beautiful. There is no reason that she has to be curvy. There is absolutely no reason that men can't find her attractive. She can be beautiful in other ways other than, oh, her body is a desirable shape. Because clearly it's not. Her only appealing attribute, aside from her being a bookworm, is that her body is hot. Like, that's just weird. There's my tangent, there's my rant. I think the funniest thing about finishing this was that that iconic You Could Rattle the Stars quote that's on all the random merch on Etsy is said by a character whose existence I completely forgot about, which says a lot about how much I actually paid attention to this book the first time I read it. However, I will say I did not hate it as much as I thought I would. I actually kind of tore through the last half of it. The first half I slogged on. It took me a couple days to get through the first like 200 pages, but these last 200 I kind of just sped through in the past two or three hours. And I'm gonna go ahead and give my final re-rating as a 3.5 stars. I put it as three stars on Goodreads because I round down instead of rounding up. One of the reasons for my lower rating is that kind of going back to the point I made when I talked about Darkest Part of the Forest where you get details interweaved in the plot that all wrap up together because it's a standalone and the author is able to start and finish the story all at once. So spoiler alert here for the book if you haven't read it but Sarah J Maas does the same thing where she drops in details about Selena's life before we've met her. We learn the name of Sam. We kind of learn how her parents died. We have Queen Elena drop in those strange hints about like blood helping blood, but those plot lines aren't resolved. You have to read on two or three or four or five books later to understand what that all means. And I know for a fact, just because I have read a couple more books in that universe and because I know people who have read them, that some of those plot points don't get resolved. They go nowhere. They end up getting retconned or changed. I feel like starting a book with anticipation of creating a series is not necessarily a bad thing, but I do feel like there's a certain level of cohesiveness you need within in the plot of each book where you shouldn't have to continue the series to understand just general ideas you know maybe that's just me maybe i just don't like being hooked onto a book and then feeling obligated to have to finish the series but i like it better when big overarching plots are kind of wrapped up and then smaller minor details can drag on into the next book and expand on the story rather than the story being dependent on you reading and knowing the entire series. I will say I went into this with a kind of negative mindset of, oh God, I'm gonna hate this. And it ended up not being as bad as I had anticipated, I guess. I know that there are very strong opinions on Sarah J Maas's writing in terms of the kind of tropes she uses, the way she writes romance, the way she writes female characters. And I do have to agree with a lot of that criticism. There was a lot that was kind of like, eh, kind of iffy, kind of icky to me, which I talked about. But I will say that when she wants to write action and when she wants to write a complicated plot, like she does it well. I feel like she just focuses on the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's not amazing and great to me personally, but it's not awful. So five years later, Throne of Glass by Sarah J Maas gets a 3.5 star rating from me, which means tomorrow I will be starting Snow Like Ashes by Sarah Rosh. All right, here we go. Day three, actually more like day seven because I haven't read for a couple days, but sitting outside, it's a beautiful day. We're gonna start Snow Like Ashes. I'm hanging out here with my laptop and my puppy. It's gonna be a good time. So I realized I've been giving the plot synopsis like five minutes into my discussion of the book. So I'm gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna give you a synopsis now in case you haven't read this. So Snow Like Ashes takes place in the fictional country known as Primoria. And in Primoria, there are eight smaller kingdoms four season kingdoms and four rhythm kingdoms. Our protagonist, Mira, is one of very few people left from the Winter Kingdom after it's been ransacked by the Spring Kingdom 16 years prior to the events of the book. Now, each kingdom has magic that emanates from their conduit, which is a symbol or piece of jewelry that holds the magic, 
and the king or queen of that kingdom is the person who is in control of the magic for their kingdom. And four of the kingdoms have a queen and the magic is passed down maternally, the other four have a king and their magic is passed down paternally. Now, the Winter Kingdom's conduit was broken in half and stolen around the same time Mira was born, and now 16 years later, she and the few remaining survivors of the Winter Kingdom are looking for the conduit to try to bring magic back to their people. It's interesting because Mira does have that not like other girls, I'm strong and tough kind of attitude, but it's kind of justified here because she is the only girl her age. She's not tough and strong and mighty just for the sake of being tough and strong and mighty, like she has a reason to be. I also really love that this isn't a teenagers against the world kind of book. Mira and Mather are the only 16 year olds fighting on their side of the war. Everyone else is in their 30s or older and you really don't get a lot of older characters like that in YA unless it's like the one elder wise mentor kind of character but this book has so many of them. Everyone that Mira knows aside from Mather is much older than her and they're not all in mentor roles either. They're just people living their lives. You know I really forgot how common love triangles were in the early 2010s. I mean like yeah love triangles are definitely still around you definitely still have characters who are both vying for the same love interest like just the very straightforward one girl is torn between two perfect men kind of love triangle i don't miss it i'll say that but uh, again knowing how this one ends i'm just kind of like rolling my eyes you know it's not awful i'm not gonna have to like hate every second of it but it's just like wow i really got used to not having to read love triangles and now i've done two books in a row with love triangles and i'm just getting bored <laughs> Not because this book isn't good, it is. I'm liking it so far, I'm about 150 pages in. Not a fan of this trope, and I'm kind of glad that it has vanished a bit. There's a quote here on page 179. It's such a violent switch in priorities that my brain can't catch up. And that's kind of how I feel about reading this. Like, the plot very much is centered on we have to restore magic and we have to find the conduit to all of a sudden I have to decide with one of these two sweaty shirtless men I like more. And then I have to decide that I matter more, that I'm not just a girl who's good for making dresses and being pretty. I have to be a fighter. And like, there's no smooth transition between the different plot points. It, it's very much just jumping from one to the next to the next instead of smoothly weaving them in together into one cohesive story. I feel like I'm reading three different plots kind of just like sandwiched together. I will say though I'm getting through this faster than I got through Throne of Glass. I'm on page 241 and it's only been a couple of hours so I'm not disliking the plot to the point where I'm slogging through it and kind of wishing it was over. I'm definitely still drawn to the story and it's definitely picking up now that we've gotten past the middle. I feel like the beginning has some weird pacing issues but as we're getting closer to the actual climax of the story it is picking up a bit and I am liking it more so. Alright we're officially now in bun and pj mode. I am on page 257. I have maybe a hundred pages left. I didn't think I would finish this in one day but it looks like I'm going to. Like I said the plot really picks up once the actual action starts but it doesn't start till like halfway through. Okay I have four chapters left and I can absolutely confirm that in my opinion this book picks up so tremendously after the first half. I'm enjoying it so much that I'm exhausted but I don't want to fall asleep because I only have four chapters left and I want to finish it but also I'm just screwing up my sleep schedule all over again. Alright kids it's about 1am and definitely past my bedtime but I just finished No Like Ashes which means took me about 12-ish hours to do. Not bad if I do say so myself. Overall consensus, as I was saying while I was in the middle of reading, the plot definitely picked up more in the second half. I did enjoy it a lot. I think my final rating is going to be kind of wavering between a 3.5 and a 4 star. I will say it does suffer some of the same faults as Throne of Glass in that oftentimes the characters or the plot seem to be prioritizing things that shouldn't be the priority in that moment when it comes to the overarching plot. But Snow Like Ashes does it where they very quickly move on from the distractions and get back to the main point which is always nice and it also doesn't suffer from the sequel pressure there is build up for a sequel you do have the opportunity to continue the story and you obviously know that if you want to continue on you can but this book ends in a way where you don't have to read the sequels if you don't want to you get a full complete story from beginning to end and Mira's story closes off in a way that's satisfying but still leaves you able to have more if you want it so I like that a lot. Overall, um, I had a nice little 12 hours reading through this again. If anyone just binge watched all of Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix and wants something else to read, go ahead and read this series. I recommend it. And with that, I guess that means tomorrow I'll be starting Legend by Marie Lu, so I will see you all in the morning. <laughs> Quick little synopsis, Legend takes place in the future dystopian Republic of America, centers around two characters, June Iperus, who is a 15-year-old military prodigy, and Day, who is also 15, one of the most wanted criminals in the Republic. And when June's brother is murdered, Day becomes the prime suspect, and June uses her military expertise to hunt him down. And meanwhile, in the background, there are some military conspiracies, some corrupt government things going on, and also a plague sweeping through the nation, which 
Mm. So this book alternates point of views. It goes back and forth between Day and Ju's perspectives. And immediately in the first two chapters, one from Day and one from June, you get so much from their characterization. You learn that they're both family-oriented, loving people. You learn that June's kind of privileged and kind of has no respect for authority, but she gets away with it because she's a smart young female and she lives in a rich neighborhood. Whereas Day is dealing with the exact same thing she is, only he's viewed as a criminal because he's poor. But at the same time, they both really care about their own reputations and they both want to be seen as more accomplished but Day can't do that because of the cards he was dealt in life whereas June tries to do that by acting out and trying to prove to the world that she can be more indifferent and just like immediately you get that from one chapter each. Like, I love Marie Lu, you guys. I love Marie Lu. The first review I ever did on this channel was for The Young Elites. It's also super refreshing to have a character who's a renowned fighter but not a murderer. So often you see characters who are just like, yeah, I'm tough, I'm strong, I'll kill without consequence. But Day is a renowned wanted criminal who has never killed before. Sometimes YA goes a little too hard on the murder willy-nilly all over the place kind of thing. Teenagers just completely murder people without question. Even like the first time they do it, it's like, like it doesn't even phase them or it does for like a chapter and they get over it and go back to more killing. In this chapter here, Day is flirting with some girl and he goes, you seem like nice company, you know? I mean, as long as you don't have the plague. And honestly, what a topical pickup line. I have to actively work to take my brain out of the mindset of having read Rebel recently because Day is 25 in that book and his behavior is normal for a 25 year old but in here he's 15 and very much behaving like he's much older than 15 and it's kind of hard for me to frame it correctly that he and June are 15. I vividly remember taking this book out of my school's library like my sophomore year of high school and reading it so I remember at the time I was like oh man that must be so cool to be so smart and so sophisticated and so confident and no 15 year old is like that. None ever in the history of teenagers. These characters definitely read older than they actually are. Legend is one of those books where after you finish the entire series, once you go back and read the first one again, your brain is just filled with this like seething rage towards certain characters, even though it's not justified yet, but you know they're eventually gonna do something and you're just like, <sighs> There's a lot of stories out there like that where reveals come later that make it so that when you read the first book again, it's not quite the same as the first time you did it. So spoilers for anyone who hasn't read this. I remember when I was 15 and I was reading about Thomas and once June starts piecing together the mystery of her brother's death, I remember being like, oh yeah, Thomas is kind of a slime ball because he's a murderer and also he's being obsessed with the little sister of the guy he murdered. Now reading this, I'm realizing that Thomas is in his early 20s and June is 15 as someone in their early 20s I like don't even make eye contact with 15 year olds and so that just adds to the slime balliness of Thomas and oh okay I have like 50 pages left so we're almost there I mean other than the slimy gross disgusting villain I love this book so much I'm loving it just as much as the last time I read it and just like that book four out of five of this challenge is complete so like I said in my Rebel review, the Legend series is one of my favorites, if not like my second or third favorite series ever. It's hard for me to rank things in a definitive order, but Legend is up there as one of my top series of all time. That has not changed. I still love this book. Obviously, again, reading it from an older lens, I do see some flaws, namely that the characters act a little older than they should, and there is just a little too much instantaneous emotion happening, I'll say, without trying to give away too much. But other than that, I mean, especially for an author's debut novel, like this is an amazing book, an amazing series. Five stars all around. I loved it in 2014. I love it now. And so with that, I am now moving on to my final book in this video that is Looking for Alaska by John Green, which I will start first thing tomorrow morning. <laughs> I think it's super funny that back then I loved this book enough to buy this collector's edition, but I literally cannot remember the plot. To be fair, it's been almost a decade since I last read this, but I kind of wanted to pick it up before I decided to watch the Hulu series so I could compare them. I think all of John Green's novels have kind of come together in a giant contemporary stew in my brain where I really can't differentiate them at all. I, I don't remember the main characters' names in this book at all. Immediately, like the first couple paragraphs, I was like, is this the one with the friend who has all the black Santas in his house or is this the one with the blind friend. No, this is the one with the boy who collects famous people's last words. Either it's been a long time or I'm just a very inattentive reader. I 
can't tell at this point. You know, as much as I make fun of the pretentiousness of John Green books, I really just think that my opinion of contemporary coming of age stories overall has been morphed because reading this, I'm not getting that same kind of vibe. Like I am very much enjoying this. Contemporary isn't really my genre. I don't read a lot of contemporary. It's not my thing. And I do find a lot of coming of age stories to feel kind of tone deaf, but this very much feels real to me. And I like that a lot because this was published in 2005. I mean, John Green is a good writer whether or not you care for his characters or his stories like he knows how to write teenagers well and I'm just really enjoying this I like it a lot honestly trying to come up with any kind of criticism I just have nothing really other than there's a lot more dialogue than description but I think that's really just the writing style and that writing style doesn't take anything away from the story we don't need long winding passages of description to get the point. It's different from everything else I've read because every other book I've read has been, I mean fiction yes, but fantasy and made up worlds and made up stories and not contemporary. So I guess I just kind of got used to the pros of fantasy writing and now I'm very much not in that and so I'm kind of trying to adjust my mindset to I'm reading a contemporary novel now and it's different. This book's only like 200 pages so I'm already halfway through. That's another thing that I feel that a lot of modern contemporary kind of shies away from is that uh Sometimes teenagers just do stupid things for the sake of doing stupid things, you know? I love the boarding school setting because it's not this fantastical, magical boarding school setting like every other book I've read where it's treated as this like magical mystical place where like all these different crazy things must happen but no they're just they're just in a high school it's just a high school away from their parents each chapter is titled by the amount of days before or after a certain event in the book happens and i vividly remember reading this chapter the day after at a basketball game my freshman year of high school i remember i was so into this that i wasn't paying attention to the game at all and like opening to this page and reading those sentences again just like threw me back and it's so weird more than anything this book out of all the ones i've read has been a massive nostalgia trip because this is really my first introduction to the ya genre aside from maybe some meg cabot books that i read back then so i finished this in two hours I can't think of much to say just because a lot of my reviewing comes from comparing similar books to the genre or similar books to that same author or books that are also published around the same time and there aren't a lot of comparisons I can make for Looking for Alaska just because again it was published so long ago and I don't remember John Green's other books enough to really make a comparison. I will say I loved it just as much as I did the first time if I can remember how I felt the first time I read it. Um, this little Pulitzer Prize on the front here I believe is absolutely deserved. Even when I read it at 14, I really didn't have the mental capacity to really understand the themes of grief and growing up and seeking to make more of your life. And the thing is, like, a lot of contemporary stories deal with these same themes and have the same kind of moral to the story, but Looking for Alaska is an example of the way to do it right. Yeah, it was great. It was great. So, eight years later, Looking for Alaska still gets a five-star rating from me. All right, kiddos, so what have we learned from all of this? Number one, my biggest takeaway is that, wow, it takes me a lot longer to read than I remember. Back in, like, 2015, I used to read, like, 60 books a year on top of being in school and at rehearsals and all sorts of stuff, and it was just not even a big deal. It took me nearly three weeks to get through the stack of five books. My second biggest takeaway is that my reading taste actually hasn't changed as much as I thought it would. I honestly thought that all of my ratings for these books would go down, but actually three out of the five are still five stars. So looking for Alaska, Legend, and The Darkest Heart of the Forest, I still keep me my five star ratings. For Snow Like Ashes I'm going to give a solid 3.5 or 3.75 stars and for Throne of Glass I'm going to go with a solid three star rating. I did give most of my reasoning in this video but if you do want to see my in-depth reviews I have re-reviewed all of these books except for Looking for Alaska. I'll get to that one in a little bit. I want to write a more in-depth review for that. But the other four I have already rewritten reviews that are on my Goodreads so if you want to go in the description and look at my profile you can see my full more articulated thoughts on those. So this has been a fun little quarantine experiment. Uh, it was definitely a lot of fun going back Back to revisit some of my old favorites and now I have so many of my old favorite books that I still want to reread but I'm not going to make videos and put myself on a time and review constraint because sometimes reading for fun is more fun than reading for the sake of a review obviously. I did put a little pressure on myself for this video but I think it was worth it. I had a lot of fun and if you guys enjoy more videos like this these reading vlogs where you see me laying in bed at three in the morning just rambling on about whatever comes to my mind um let me know. I'm not sure if anyone really needs to see 3 a.m. Deja laying in bed reading Presenting herself for challenging herself to read five books over like a two-week period, but who knows maybe that's entertaining to you <laughs> And with that this challenge is complete and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye